Fish drops unfiltered before we get into our interview with the great Kelly Sacco. We have, uh, I guess, some news to talk about, some uh, small tidbits of Marlins news, finally. The minor league development camp, Isaac, you were there. Just the two points. I think the one point I want to touch up is on J.J. Bladé. The man is looking huge. You, you told us uh, Christina DiNicola posted a picture. You posted a picture. And then just other players that caught your eye there uh, on the development camp. Yeah, well, the first guy who just stood out automatically because I didn't know it was him. It was just this human walking muscle that showed up with 30 pounds stronger than he did on opening in spring training of 2021. And yeah, Blade, he got into it a little bit with the reporters about what he's done. It's all, you know, nutrition, 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 plus some working out. Um, he looked good and he says he feels it when, you know, he's taking batting practice, he picks up a bat. So, you know, expect some maybe better power numbers from him this year. I don't know if it'll translate to, you know, a better overall player, but he definitely looks good. He looks big and he looks confident, which is the most important thing. Yeah, I don't know if you have any other players you may want to touch up on. I know we saw some videos of Jose Salas, I'm pretty sure. Cody Morris that you showed yeah, us a little bit. Uh, nice reminder that Jose Salas is a switch hitter. I know he didn't get money, uh, but appearances as a righty. Cody Morris was there taking hacks. Uh, Tanner and Brady Allen, both as well in the same hitting group, taking some nice hacks. Peyton Burdick has some of the best raw power in, in the development camp, from what I can see. And other than that, it's someone that I did like, you know, it was like sort of a, a big just guy is Noah Williamson. He's got some nice BP power. He's a good BP player. Um, just, you know, another name to give you. But other than that, it was just mainly regular batting practice, no live. And there were obviously defensive drills. Yidi Cap had some nice batting practice as well. But other than that, it was all very, uh, very neutral stuff. Not, not many, not much fun stuff going on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but was it Noah Williamson that was the one that Max Myers struck out swinging? Was that the video that I think it was uh, Danny Alvarez? It was, the day be- it was on the the day before he got there. The, the oh, last the first one. you know I what? Think I was- remember what I know a video you're talking about. I'm not sure. Maybe Eli can tell us, um, but I'm not sure. I, I, I was almost certain it was in. I think someone was. I think Alex Carver told us, but. Yeah, it, no, may have, oh, it, it may have been Sam Prater as the strikeout victim there. The catcher. It was Sam Prater. It was Sam yeah. Prater. Now yeah. I remember. Yeah. There we go. All right. And uh, I guess the it's not much, but there's actually a little bit of bigger news when it comes to this. The Miami Marlins had a 40-man trading session. Mainly the guys that live in Miami. So it's Jazz, Lewin, uh, Jordan Holloway was there. And then a name that I think surprised me the most, John Birdie was there, Isaac. I mean... We this guy has been a ghost ever since he got the concussion injury. We finally see that he's there, and I think he worked out with the team. What are your thoughts on that? And then we have some other new guys I want to talk about. Yeah, you said it, John Birdie. Uh, we hadn't heard about him or from him in a very long time since he went down with that concussion. It's good to see him back doing baseball activities, and just the overall, you know, just fact that they're all there preparing for the major league season as if it's going to happen. They're just doing what they can. And all in West Palm Beach, it was really nice to see some baseball being played by big league regulars. I know we saw some, you know, minor league stuff in Jupiter, but to see, you know, Jazz and Maggie Rowe and Cooper and Braxton Garrett and Sandy Alcanta, the new $55 million man, you know, doing some live VP, it was really a breath of fresh air to watch. Danny Alvarez, of course, was there providing us very generously with this content that you guys can see on the screen. And yeah, it was just so nice to see all these guys. Lewin Diaz had some nice hacks and Sandy Alcantara also struck him out. So it's always fun to see... Uh, inter-squad uh, live BP. Yeah, and uh, just for information, there was no new players, though, so no Wendell, no Avi, no uh, who's Stallings. It, uh, Stallings. All these guys pretty much are the ones that are based in Miami. So as you can see, Cody Poteet is there. He actually was on the injured list right before. Mm-hmm. So that's a good name to see there. You also have Miggy, Garrett Cooper was injured finally, taking full BP, although we've been seeing some other videos. So, so yeah, and then the other little takeaway I had was that Nick Fortes was there. I mean, I, I was. I'm, I'm glad he's there, and hopefully he gets that back catcher's role. I don't know if you have anything else. And finally, they use this. They, they've been tracking their data with the speedometer. I don't think you usually see many players on their own doing this type of thing. So I don't know if you have any other takeaways from uh, the little 40 man workout that they've been having. Yeah, um, Nick Fortes. I he seemed like the type of player that would be there at these camps. He wants to get as many you know reps as possible. He would be my pick for the backup catcher spot. 100. percent um, well, we just got to see what Alex Jackson, Jackson can do. He's got minor league options. He's got control. So he will be definitely a factor when it comes to that backup job. I think something that was interesting was that only two guys that were there who aren't on the Marlins technically are, were Devin Marrero and Lewis Brinson. So the fact that they're still, you know, working out with the teams just shows, you know, the level of, you know, 
brotherhood that they have with each other. I know Devin Marrero has been up and down for a long time with Miami, Brenton since 2018. So they were all there working together. And about the speedometer, I'm, I'm not educated enough to tell you. I'm sure maybe the coaches, maybe Mel Stoudemire gave it to Blyer. I was like, here, go use that with Sandy. <laughs> but, that picture uh, was hilarious. You usually don't see the players. And if you were to see a player with it, it would be Richard Blyer. Yeah. And I assume, I'm not sure, the guy to the left of Dan Castano in the picture, was that what Sean Gunther or Stephen Oker? The the, to the left. Of Castano, yeah, that guy. No one with the Nike uniform. I, or the when Nike I saw that picture, I couldn't. I know very to the right, I couldn't tell you the guy on the left if Eli wants to hop in and tell us. Yeah. I think Kevin got it right. That's Gunther all the way in the that's far Gunther. left. Yeah, yeah. I, I was reading the article and I, and I saw Sean Gunther and I was like, oh, that's the guy you were talking about. That's the guy in the picture. Who's the guy in the green shirt underneath Birdie? That's Bender. That's Bender. Oh, that's Anthony Bender. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, Bender, yeah. Paul Campbell, Braxton Garrett. Oh, Paul Campbell. Yeah. And uh, I was able to, yeah, Paul Campbell was there. And I was able to ask a certain reporter who was there about, you know, Velos. Like, he did report that Luzardo was up to 97. Sandy was, um, 97 98 and he actually mentioned the biggest surprise well not surprise but biggest you know piece of news was bender who was up to 99 miles an hour in the in the camp so that uh nice little piece of news and it's really should get you excited about this anthony bender guy because he could be a late ending option for miami all season long and i think one more thing we should mention is i know they were saying Lewin diaz was a little bit more bulked up i don't know this i think uh, no one told us that he noticed it but uh, they, they, that was the same situation last year, and then yeah, yeah he actually looks, if anything, maybe a little smaller than he did when he pulled up to <laughs> 2021 spring training. I know that was the year, the off season, that he really bulked up a little bit. Uh, he looks it just mirrors or is Cooper a little bit bulked up too? He looks good. Nice. Cooper looks good. They all look good. You know, they're the professional athletes. Holloway, hopefully he'll throw some strikes. I gave him a lot of, I gave him ammunition to be a good pitcher this year. I put him at top 20 in my prospect list. So you put him top 15. Put, you, put, I think you put him top. I think 15. he was number 16. So. Oh, so, yes, like, we're going to wrap it up here for me and Isaac, and then now we will go to the interview with Kelly. Here on Fish Stripes Unfiltered, it is an honor to present this new interview with Kelly Sacco. You know Kelly as a host and a reporter with Bally Sports Florida and as a color commentator with Marlins Radio. She has such a unique perspective as a former high-level softball player and as a Miami native. She brings a whole lot of energy to every conversation she has, it was really enlightening to learn more about her unique background and the process that she goes through to be ready to broadcast to South Florida when the Marlins are in season. So without further ado, enjoy. Fish Stripes Unfiltered back at it with another episode. Episode 12, back here with Isaac Azud. And before we get to our special two guests that we have today, Isaac, my man, how are you? Uh, I'm excited for this special guest, bro. Yeah, man, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. Very fortunate that she was able to find the time to join us. So I'll let you introduce our two guests. Yeah, we got uh, Kelly Sacco from the Miami Marlins, Valley Sports, Florida. Uh, son, yeah, Florida. And then we have Eli Sussman with us, our boss and great friend of ours who's going to be joining us tonight. Uh, Kelly, how are you? Excited to have you. I'm so excited to be here. Honestly, I am honored to be asked to be part of this podcast. So thanks guys for having me. Eli, how are you, man? We're excited to have you. Yeah, I was going to be here anyway, Kevin. As, as <laughs> no, no, no. I was the one setting that up, but I appreciate you inviting me to be in front of the screen. Uh, That's because, what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really admire all the work that Kelly does and the energy that she brings and the knowledge that she brings to, to all her roles. Yeah, there's a whole lot to cover with her. So it's great to be with you guys. Make you guys sure are you making like and blush. <laughs> Make sure you like and subscribe <laughs> on YouTube. Follow us on all the podcast uh, feeds where you listen to us. and. Let's get started. Kelly, how's the offseason been? I know you've been going uh, to some minor league development camps, which me and Isaac spoke about before that uh, we, we came here with you. So how's that been and just the offseason in general? Well, first of all, it's always great to be out there. It was different, uh, but I feel like that's been almost the norm. Different has been the norm over the last couple of years while we still deal with the pandemic. So we really haven't had a, I guess you would say, normal offseason in the past couple of years. So you know, off season, you're trying to make the best of it. Um, on my end, because I work pre uh, predominantly in baseball, um, I try to you know step, step away from it all in the beginning and just kind of spend a lot of time with my family and, and pursue some other interests and some other things I kind of have going on. But it's always fun when you finally get back up there to Jupiter and just see that huge amount of talent that the Marlins have in their minor league system. So that was exciting. It felt really good to be out there again with all the reporters. Saw Isaac out there. So always fun. Always fun when you're back on the baseball field. 
Yeah, for sure. And it was awesome because, you know, part of the reason that we're out there for minor league development camp is because of the lockout situation. So I just want to get maybe your takes. I don't know if you were able to watch the Rob Manfred press conference. I think it was yesterday morning. So just, you know, your takeaways from how the CBA negotiations are going so far. Well, I think it's probably the same as everybody else. I mean, I think everybody who's involved in this situation from the fans to players to everybody involved to media, I think it's just a little bit of frustration. Everyone just wants there to be a baseball season already. They want kumbaya. They want this to get figured out. So you know, it just it kind of is what it is. I try not to really just think too much or um, – really take away too much for any of those until I see, <laughs> until I hear that a negotiations and CBAs is done. Like I, I really try not to pay attention to everything that's going on in the media between that. He said this and this say this and that mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't care. Someone call me when a deal is finally done and we can finally look at a schedule and say, okay, on this day, baseball's back. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to take away from the press conference itself, especially I think the universal DH. So that that is going to help the Marlins a lot. Um, we also get, a very weird situation, the draft lottery. I mean, I've seen this in the NBA. I know, Isaac, you don't watch too much NBA. I don't know about you, Kelly, but I know Eli does as well. Isaac, your takes on, on the CBA negotiations, and then we'll go to Kelly and Eli. Well, yeah, unfortunately, we can't really get into why the DH helps the Marlins. Yeah. And all, you know, sort of glean that. You know the player, guys. All right, we know, know the players. Um, regarding the draft lottery, I, it's an interesting situation. I haven't really seen how it plays out in other sports. I do know the NBA does have it. It's just an interesting situation, for example, of a team, like I said yesterday, if a team goes 40 and 122 and they don't end up with the first overall pick. It's a little bit of a dicey situation, but, you know, we'll see how it plays out because it'll be, a, I think, a first time ever on, in Major League Baseball to happen. Yeah, I'm not going to quote Rob Manfred, but I know he said this would make teams less, more competitive to, to win games and be able to, to have success and make the league more competitive. What are your thoughts on the draft lottery, Kelly? And actually, it's funny, Peter spoke about this, Peter Pratt on his lockdown Marlins. So I think he kind of predicted it in a way that this would come to, to the negotiations. That's one of those things too. I think that you just kind of have to see how it plays out. I mean, when you think about it, you're like, okay, it kind of makes sense. And then, you know, there's now no benefit of quote unquote tanking, which is what he's trying to, to, to eliminate. And what the players, uh, one of the many things that the players were looking for in CBA, just to make it a more enjoyable product to watch. Um, and as for like the universal DH, I think we all saw that coming, especially after the 2020 season. You saw in the 2020 season, it helps protect the pitchers and it just brings more offense to the game. So I think that was something that everyone's like, well, yes, we knew that this was coming. Yeah, Eli, Rob Manford also mentioned some other things. I know you were watching the press conference. So if you could tell the people what uh, what other um, agreements they came up on in this, uh, I guess, press conference that he had. Yeah, well, I mean, as we're recording this, there still is a little bit of sketchiness around what particularly Definitely. he has in mind because um, we we don't need to slam him on this podcast, but there have been <laughs> there's he's a lawyer. He's a guy that when he speaks publicly, um, he has an interesting relationship with the truth and with specifics. <laughs> so, so I'm curious to see you know the full details of the proposal that they'll be sending to the Players Association over the weekends. Um, I mean, you did bring up the, the lottery, and so the specifics on that are pretty key. I think anything um, on that front is a step in the right direction because we've had um, just to call it the Orioles, for example. I mean, like three of the last four years, they finished with the worst record, and they get the number one overall pick. And I, yeah, I'd like it to be so that's not a literal race to the very bottom. That's the one thing that does it really does make the game difficult to watch when you see uh, players on those rosters that aren't really part of the present or the future of the teams. It, it's just it's not only is it like a lower quality of baseball, but it doesn't really serve the fans purposes either. You know, if the fans can't understand why certain players are on the field at that time, then that's that's really all that matters. All that matters at the end of the day is the fans. And that's one thing that even if they didn't recognize it being an issue, I think doing something about it is very important. The DH, as you said, is, is something that we have seen coming. Um, I mean, the, the bigger, really the big hang up between these sides has been about taking care of players that are early in their major league careers um, without naming anybody in, in particular, just around the league, some of the very best players are guys in their early twenties that are still far away from free agency, um, but still, even though they're respected as the best players in the game, they're not being compensated that way. And this system has just been stuck for decades, really, it, it, as it's set up where it's a long time for these players to reach a point where they get that record-breaking deal. 
it's and it's not good. I don't think for recruiting younger athletes to play baseball. Baseball is probably more so than any of these other major sports. It just takes a long time for you to be compensated with your market value deep into your career. And so that system was unfair to players and we'll see exactly how much it moves into the right direction in terms of getting rookies, pre-arbitration eligible guys better taken care of. Yeah. And you mentioned like some teams, you know, like the Atlanta Braves are able to compensate their players, their stars pretty fairly quickly, but there's other lower market teams that they really, you know, the players, the good players, you know, we can name a few on Miami that just, they're going to have to wait a very long time unless they were high, high draft picks. It's gonna be a long time until they make good money. Yeah. Speaking of which, speaking of the DH, Kelly, the last time that you know there was a universal DH was in 2020. I was not covering baseball yet, but I did want to get you, you know your thoughts on and that experience of 2020 when there was no one there, no fans, and just covering games like that. I want to know how it was like. Yeah, as you mentioned, 2020, we had the universal DH, and as you saw, it just kind of opened up opportunities for players, especially for the veteran players who might be out of a job if it, if it's only half the league where they could potentially get that universal DH job. So now it does uh, open the uh, open the way for veteran players, which is going to be nice. Again, more offense. 2020, my goodness, I can't believe it was two years ago. Yeah. What? It yeah. feels like yesterday, which is crazy. But um, it was a crazy experience. It was something where I was happy and definitely grateful to be able to covering to be able to cover the team at all. But it was one of those things where it was so – odd when like the Marlins for instance clinched the playoffs I was grateful to be working that game but they're in Chicago and I'm all the way in Miami in an empty stadium with the lights off <laughs> sitting by myself on the field and I'm like yes yay and I'm like wait there's no one to celebrate with it's just me like by myself like dancing on the field all excited that uh, you know interviewing the players and coaches and everyone from afar from just a million miles away it felt like but it was nice that technology and everything had come so far where we were still able to be part of it, even though it's from far away. Um, so that entire experience, it, it was pretty crazy when it, it all first started. I think like most people, I personally thought, I'm like, yeah, this will be a few weeks. It'll be great. Here we are two, two years later. <laughs> but it was a lot of adjusting. It was a lot of trying to be patient adjusting and once we found out okay here's the schedule here's what we're going to do you had to be very creative in the way that you covered the team you didn't we didn't get the same access that we normally do and and, and everyone did the best that they could and everybody was very generous with their time so it was it was definitely an adjustment from day to day reporting from far away and then when the team was in town I would be up in the stands by myself. No one was able with a robot camera in front of me. No one was allowed to come anywhere near me. And when I'd be interviewing a player who was on the field, said player would be like on the field and I'd be like up in the sections, like two sections up and I'd be like, hey, you good? Very good. And then I turned my back to them because the robot camera was in front of me. So my back would technically be to the player and the robot cameras in front of me. So uh, it was it was a whirlwind. It was a lot of adjustments, but I'm glad that we were able to do something. Wow. So yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that was kind of like a nutshell of what we went through in 2020. A lot of Zoom interviews. I learned what Zoom was in 2020, <laughs> like the rest of the world. Yeah. No. You you made it feel like I was there, a part of it. Wow. You did a, a great job of elaborating on how that experience was. One of those ex um, adjustments that you had to do was calling games. Well, congratulations on you. You know, calling so many yeah. games on the radio. You know, really amazing how far everyone's come. But I want to ask you. I asked Glenn Geffner the same thing. How much He's more the difficult best, is it, Glenn? Yeah, Glenn is amazing. He's awesome. I just want to know how much more difficult is it to call a game from monitors when the team is on the road versus you know being up in the press yeah. box and calling it from there. That's insanely difficult, insanely yeah. difficult, especially for someone who was so new to doing it to begin with. Right. So before 2021, which was this past season, I had only called two games before that ever in the major leagues ever. And I was filling in for Dave Van Horn one weekend in like August of 2019. I that I guess he, yeah, yeah. He had like the, he had the weekend off or something. You want to fill in? I was like, okay. And I'm like sweating profusely. And I'm just like, oh my God, like breathing into like a paper bag. I'm like, oh my goodness. And like Glenn was absolutely wonderful. Made me feel so comfortable. And Kyle Seeloff was incredible. And just everybody 
there and Dave called me right before the game and was just like, you've got this. You're so good. Like, da, 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 da. And I'm like, hey, thank you. And I'm like, <gasps> borderline tears. Like everyone was just so amazingly supportive. But um, yes, I had only done two games before that in MLB to begin with. So then all of a sudden I got lucky where the majority of my games in 2021 were at Lone Depot Park and it was in person. But I did have a couple series maybe that the team – was on the road and I was covering the radio and it was just insanely difficult for many reasons. I, I think Eli mentioned I have a lot of energy. This is non-caffeinated energy, by the way. <laughs> if you can imagine, I know, another level. I know, not for everybody. But it's, it's hard to keep up the energy because you're not there. You don't feel the energy of the crowd. It's hard information-wise because you're not in person and you're not there able to speak to the players and the coaches before the game. You're not on the field and you're not absor observing things that you may able to observe. Um, three, you're at uh, the liberty of just whatever camera feeds are sent to you. So when you're there, I always try to look, and I'm sure Glenn told you the same thing, we're not just looking at what's going on in the field. We're looking into the dugouts. We're looking into the stands. We're looking all over the place. And, mm -hmm. and you're not getting that same liberty when you're from, you know, thousands of miles away and you're getting whatever feed the home team cameras happen to send you. And then, of course, there's technology. And I think it was once, it, I think it was Kyle Seeloff was calling the game with maybe JP, Aaron, Sebia, and then just the feed just went dark and they all just go, oh. <laughs> and, Kyle, and Kyle was like, yeah, we can't see anything anymore. Sorry, guys. Oh my <laughs> so it just, everything went dark. And you guys could, could chit chat with him about that down the road. But uh, yeah, so it's just, you're just like, oh, what do we do? And sometimes it just becomes snowy. So a lot of challenges. Again, we're grateful that technology has advanced so much that was even an option. Uh, because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be working for half the year. So <laughs> grateful we were able to do it, but definitely a lot more challenging. Well, Kelly, for 2022, have you received some sort of confirmation that both for the radio stuff and for ballet sports that you'll be traveling again the way that you used to? Well, I think everything's still, I, I think the hope is that we're going to. I think that the for certain everything isn't going to happen until there's a deal, there's a schedule, all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we will. So just we're waiting for the CBA to get figured out so we can plan our lives. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what is your routine? I mean, in 2021, it was a little more of a normal year. Uh, what was that routine for you going into home games every day? Uh, so yeah, if you want to elaborate on that. yeah. So what's, what's interesting is I've always been until really the past year and been in more of a backup role. So I, I personally was just starting to learn what my routine was when the pandemic happened and I had to kind of create a whole new routine. So every single year has been pretty much a brand new routine and I haven't really <laughs> had to experience on a day-to-day -day basis what a normal routine, I guess, would be with normal access and normal everything. So in 2021, it was another year of adjustments, but that's life. And what I would pretty much do is I'd wake up in the morning and I'd go to my computer and I'd send my producer, you know, do whatever research I had to do uh, that was left to do that I didn't do the night before or any new stories that popped up, anything along the lines of that. So I would go and uh, what I do is I send a list of story ideas to when I'm on the sideline to my producer, the game producer, and talk to my pregame producer as well. Like, hey, this is what I'm thinking for pregame. What are you guys thinking? Because our pregame producer, we have a different producer for pregame, postgame, and a different producer for in-game. So you talk to pregame and postgame, you're like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Does this fit with, with what you guys are thinking? They'll either be like, yeah, absolutely. Or they'll say, oh, no, actually, I had a different idea for you because we're having someone else cover this, whatever it might be. And you say, okay, very good. And then I send all my in-game ideas to my in-game producer. And I try to send anywhere between like six to ten per game. Because a lot of people, I know you didn't ask, so a lot of people ask what role I enjoy the most or what's hard at, and what role I enjoy the most. And there isn't necessarily a role I enjoy more because there's so many different parts of each role and they're so different that I love. But I think the most challenging role, and everyone's always surprised when I say this, is the sideline role. And the reason why sideline reporting is just so much more difficult is because so many other outside factors determine whether I can do my job or not. So if I send, right, six to, the reason why I try to send like six to 10 story ideas per game is because 
I might have two, three stories on the starting pitcher or something and they, you know, scratch him the last second or he gets injured or he gets his butt kicked and he gets taken out of the game after an inning and a half. And you're like, oh, <laughs> those were three of my story ideas or a guy that, you know, from the bullpen that you wanted to talk about doesn't get in the game that day or the game ends up being a blowout or a game ends up being so close that it's just now not the time to go have you talk about a different story about a certain player. So that being said, I try to send a ton of story ideas because knowing that something's not going to work out, knowing that some of them aren't going to be the right time to talk about them. And then once I get my pregame, my pregame kind of, not, not script, it's a format for my pregame producer, I chit chat with them and say, okay, what sound do you need? In the beginning of 2021, I had tier two access and I believe I was the only one of our talent that time who had that. So I was allowed to be on the field, which was great. I was allowed to interview players um, within six feet with mask on, but I was allowed to be really close up, which was wonderful. So I would try to get a lot of sound for, for our pregame show, sound that I might need in game. So I'd show up to the field, depending on the game, usually in a normal year, it would be around two o'clock because clubhouse access would open at three. And yeah, just get to the field. I try to get whatever sound I might need, whether it's from the manager or players, uh, any particular interviews, kind of sort through my story ideas again, talk to my producer, say, okay, what are we thinking for sending for this, the open for this, and pretty much go from there, find five minutes to eat <laughs> and then go do my game. <laughs> You hinted cool. at something that sounded very familiar. You brought up Glenn uh, a moment ago, and he, he was on with us, and he told us that 90%, if not more, the research that you put into this, the stories, the stats, they don't make it onto the air because you're, it's just not the right time. So uh, it sounds like you're kind of cut from the same cloth of just being so overprepared because you never know exactly what's going to make it onto the broadcast. I think it was Glenn who also said he's like, you're only going to use 10% of your notes. The problem is you never know what 10% is, right. you know, what 10% of those notes you're going to use. So it's almost, it's almost frustrating because you're like, I did all this research and I didn't get to use X, Y, and Z. But if it's just not the right time, it's just not the right time. You don't want to just make the broadcast worse because you just have to get in that one note about that player's grandfather's second cousin twice removed to happen to whatever the story might be. And you're like, eh, it's a one, one ball game in the bottom of the ninth. This is not the time to talk about that, even though it's game three. So that's exactly right. I mean, you just don't know you have to over prepare because personally, if I don't over prepare, I feel very under prepared, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a lot of preparation, a lot yeah, of homework. Well probably takes a lot of discipline to not, you know, just try and throw out every single bit of information that you're able to research, you know, because it, you just want to show it off that you were able to get it. Now, I used to want to be a broadcaster as well. For anyone that may want to be, what would be like your piece of advice to anyone that wants to get in that industry? Ooh, piece of advice. I would give for anyone who wants to be in this industry. Whether it's radio or TV or, you know. Yes, it would be, honestly, shadow the people that you think in the job that you think you want because, and I say this specifically because it isn't the job for everyone and it isn't the lifestyle for everyone. And that's okay. And that's the thing. I think that this type of, I have a lot of friends who are, they will flat out say to me, they're like, I don't get your job. I don't get your life and I don't get your job. I don't understand. You, you're every day is different. When you're in the season, you have two days off a month. Like we don't understand that. We don't, we don't get it. I <laughs> like, don't, can't wrap my head around this. And it's not for everybody. So I would say, make sure you shadow someone in the job that you think you want. Because it's very, you have to figure out with this job, first of all, if it's a lifestyle for you. Because if you get into it and you realize this isn't my lifestyle, you're not gonna be happy and you're not gonna produce your best work. And just in whatever you do in life, you wanna be happy and, and, and it's gonna reflect in your work. So I would definitely say shadow someone. I think that's probably my first piece of advice for someone who's not yet in the industry. Make sure that it's the industry for me and then go from there. And talk about the epitome of someone you can shadow and someone like Dave Van Horn and Glenn Geffner. Like, wow, just the Marlins were really lucky to have those two guys as a radio broadcast team for such a long time. No, I'm just so, so blessed, honestly, to be able to work with both of them. Yeah. They're just uh, outside of incredible broadcasters, just amazing people. They made me, yeah. made me feel so welcomed. And this is from, from day one when I used to, before I got into television and doing all these kind of things, I was an in-game host mm -hmm. for the Marlins for oof, maybe five years. I five remember years that. Was. You do? Oh, I yeah, do remember. Good team. Marlins Vision host Kelly. Marlins they Vision. Did. I think you did, I for my birthday, I think you may have like 
had a game for show for Did me. I? I believe yeah. so, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like people tell me that all the time and it makes me so excited. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. I, I love that job and it was wonderful. And I had so much fun. I love the people that I worked with and I'm still very good friends with a lot of them. But I used to always like pop in to their radio booth before I did any TV and stuff. And I'd just be like, hi, how you doing? And they were just so wonderful to me. I, they're just incredible people. And they, they taught me a lot. They taught me a lot because unlike I, you guys, and I told you this before we went on air, um, like how incredible that you, at such a young age that you guys know what you want to do and, and kind of like the interests that you have in this world at your age, all of your ages, I did not, <laughs> I did not care, especially like in, in high school, I had, I would have thought I was crazy if I told myself, oh, you're going to be, you're going to be on TV or be broadcaster. High school me would have been like, very funny. <laughs> ha ha. I would never do that in a million years. So that being said, just having people like Dave and Glenn and Kyle Seeloff who's part of that team, I, is, I'm just so lucky to have had them. They taught me so much and have been so supportive and are just wonderful human beings. Yeah, moving on to, I guess, the more baseball side of things. For the ones who may not know, Kelly was a softball player for Palmetto, and then she went on to play for Syracuse. And, wow, when I searched up the accolades, it took up almost the whole page. I'm not, and um, you led the Panthers to the 2008 State Championship, 2006 and 2007 State Farm Sportsman Award, 2007 named South Dade News Leader MVP, 2006 and 2008 Miami Herald Pitcher of the Year Distinction, 2007 uh, Miami Herald Hitter of the Year, and there's so much more. But Kelly, <laughs> your time in Palmetto, I mean, if you could describe it to us playing and then going on to Syracuse. Uh, my time in Palmetto was probably the most fun I had, honestly, playing softball. It was back then, uh, high school softball. We used to have these massive crowds that used to come out to watch us play, and there was just so much pride behind playing for our high school and and high school softball was insanely competitive back then. I know just there would always be at least like half the girls from every single team in the district and every single team that we would play who would end up going D1. So there was a ton of competitiveness um, between all the teams. And it was just so much fun. It was such a blast playing for my high school. I remember when I was a little bit younger going to those high school games and seeing those girls and and playing under the lights. And it was just this, this wonderful thing. We had wonderful, wonderful coaches who got me to where I am today, quite frankly. And it was just, it was just fun. It was so much fun winning the state championship. One of the greatest freaking days of my life still it was so awesome. It was something that we worked really, really hard for. We made it every single year I was there. We lost the state championship my freshman year, my junior year. We lost in, I think uh, we got third place, maybe, or four, third or fourth place my sophomore year. And it was, it was just that finally, that finally feeling senior year, something you just keep working for, keep working for, and you finally do it. We did it in um, extra inning fashion. I pitched wow. all 12 innings. It was 12 innings long and the wow. seven innings the day before and got the game winning hit so it was just it was just a dream honestly that's exactly what it was it was a dream to play for high school and i know it's it, kevin over there is probably like yeah okay paul meadow he went to he goes to coral reef guys so that was one of our rivals kevin oh hey fun story for kevin we played coral reef my freshman year on a record i don't know if someone broke this record a 24 inning game against coral reef 24 yes exactly that? he did isaac's eyes went this big they would have called the game innings. Well, they had to call the game after, I think it was the 22nd inning because the lights, we were playing at Coral Reef and we started the game at three and they had no lights. So they had to call the game because it got too dark. We had to come back lights, the day though. before. Exactly. We had to come back the day after to finish the game and Coral Reef brought the entire high school out to cheer against us. I hate to tell you, but we won. <laughs> <laughs> No, Corey has never been the greatest in sports, I will say. They, they were very good at softball back then, though. Back then, yeah. Now, <laughs> and you matched the case. And winning, like, your senior year, there's no worse feeling for any high school student, you know, whoever plays sports, and just, you know, knowing that you lost your final game and, you know, your high school career is over. But then you – that wasn't it for you. You know, you went to Syracuse. One, you got to tell me about how was that weather because it must – if I'm not mistaken, I think it's in the middle of nowhere, Syracuse. And just it's how it was adapting from, you know, high school softball to, you know, pretty elite school in Syracuse softball. 
Goodness. Okay. So weather wise, I had never seen snow before I went to Syracuse, New York, which might as well be the frozen tundra. It's closer to Canada than New York City. So it's upstate New York. So I'd never seen snow, had no idea what I was getting myself into. We got snowed out on Mother's Day, two years in a row. On Mother's Day? That's May. Yes. Mother's Day is in May for those of you out there who may have forgot. Yes. Mother's Day. So we only, um, that came with its own set of challenges in the sense that we only had, I think, eight home games in like a 55 game season, eight home games, I think it was, because it was too cold (laughs) to play up there. It would be snowing all the time. So we were on the road constantly, which came with its challenges. uh, But I would do it a thousand times over. Syracuse University, just the schooling side of it was so incredible. I loved going to school every day. We had the most incredible professors. Uh, It's one of the number one schools in the nation, if not the number one school for broadcasting. Mm -hmm. My professors were incredible. I loved all my classmates and that campus. I I thought it was actually going to Auburn before I visited Syracuse. I'd visited Auburn before and my mother actually swam at Syracuse. So my mother and my uncle swam at Syracuse. My mom was an Olympic swimmer. So when I went on that recruiting trip, I really thought like, okay, you know, this is fun. You know, let's go see mom's old school. Me and my dad would joke. We're like, we're going to go see your mom's old school type of thing. And we, we, we turned, I remember the head coach at the time had picked me up from the airport and when we turned onto the campus. I literally went, I was like, oh no, (laughs) I'm going to end up at school here. This is the most gorgeous place I've seen in the entire world and such an incredible school. I would do it a million times over, even though I was freezing for four years straight. (laughs) <laughs> yes yeah, I've, I've seen the pictures of the campus it's it's really nice uh and then there are also some accolades you ranked third on the team with five home runs in your freshman year led the team with 432 putouts and a 0.987 fielding percentage that was your sophomore year and then third team all big east your junior year so a lot of accolades there and uh so you you this year we've seen some of your Spanish interviews, especially with Jesus Sanchez Eli. If you want to play the clip very quickly, so Kelly oh could boy. see. That was your second home run of the game. Your fifth in six games. How comfortable are you feeling at the major league level? Qué cómodo se siente en este nivel. Bueno, realmente uno está buscando la confianza. Estamos buscando eh, lo que es la comida, y ya que están brindando la comida, uno tiene que comer, ¿sabes? <laughs> He's been looking for that confidence, and he has found it, and you have seen the way that that has progressed here at the major league level. So, so how has that experience been speaking uh, bilingually and being able to translate for uh, for the people watching that may not speak uh, Spanish? I'm definitely uh, wishing I listened to my mom even a little bit more when I was younger, and she's just like, you guys speak Spanish, and I'm like, no, I don't want to. And I'm like, huh, mom, you were right. So I, I am just happy that <laughs> when yeah. I was younger, I'd always like fight her about it. But um, now I'm just like, speak to me in Spanish and only Spanish because I'm able to connect to some of these guys in a way that I probably wouldn't be able to, or, or at least not on that level if I didn't speak the language. So I'm definitely grateful. It's definitely something I constantly practice. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm just very grateful that I'm able to have those relationships and, and have, be able to communicate without relying on someone else. Do you think you're able to um, translate as well as Luis Durante yet or not yet? Louis is the king. I can never, I mean, he's a whole nother level. He is what I aspire to be. I mean, I can never compare myself. Have you guys heard him sing too? I have to throw that I, out there. Yes, yeah. Unfortunately, I have. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Louis just, he's the greatest human being. I absolutely love Louis. Everybody on that communication staff, Louis just, Awesome. So no, I'm not at the level of Louis. And sometimes I will go to Louis and just be like, Louis or Daniel Alvarez. And I'll be like, hey, make sure I got this right, right? Okay, that's the right way to say, you know, like this phrase, did it transfer over? Did I say this correctly? So I'm always looking to them because those guys are the uh, the goats. I must yeah, say. and someone else you can ask for, for help sometimes. I know Pablo Lopez did a great job of translating one time. He is a superb at that job as well. Wonderful human being, player, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if you have any, I guess, crazy stories broadcasting. 2020 was a crazy year, and 2021. I assume some madness must have happened at some point. Goodness. I'm going to – we might have to circle back at that if we if, if we have any time. I'm going to try to think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to think on that. Crazy stories. Watch, guys. I'm going to end up, like, 
tweeting you in three days. Be like, I finally thought of my crazy story. Right. Uh, uh, nothing comes to mind at the moment. Nothing comes to mind at the moment. But I remember a crazy story. I like guess kind of a crazy story in 2019. It was one of the very first trips I ever filled in on the road. And we got stuck on the runway in LA, leaving to Chicago for like five hours. <laughs> there was something wrong with our plane. So we got stuck on the plane. And I just remember playing heads up because I'm a child and I need to be entertained. Heads yep. up with like Kyle Seeloff and, and Louis, Louis Durante and Sarah, <laughs> our, um, <laughs> Sarah, our uh, social media director. And I remember a couple of the players got bored and they came back and they're just like, what are you guys doing? Can we play with you? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> Like, here's heads up. This is how you play. And I'm sitting there like a child. Everyone else is probably like, Kelly, shut up. So I guess that was, we ended up getting to Chicago, Chicago at like five in the morning. But um, yeah, so it was one of, one of those, one of those trips. There's always one. And I just happen to be on it. <laughs> but I'll keep, I'll keep thinking about that crazy story from 2021. I'm sure something will come to me the second we hang up. <laughs> Sounds good. And that's exactly where we will end this episode with Kelly. Kelly, thank you for coming on. It was a great time. Uh, if you have any advice or anything else you want to tell the people watching oh goodness no just uh thanks for having me and uh, if you have any i guess dream or anything that you guys are are looking to get into go after it go after it 100 percent. And, and and if you might fail you know you might fail just get up and do it again if you love it that much just keep trying and um i guess my final piece of advice is sometimes you got to create what you want to be a part of yeah. and if yeah, yeah if yeah guys if there's something that especially in the, the world that we have today and look how great this is i'm doing an interview with you guys on my phone from home we're all in different places so there's so many ways that you can go out there and be productive yourself and just be go-getter so if you want it that much go after it create what you want to be a part of yep and that's exactly where we end it thank you guys for watching subscribe on youtube and wherever you see your podcast feeds and uh, we'll see you guys all in the next one peace out and go fish we gotta end it off right <laughs>